Hello, everyone, and welcome to another Applying Ethology webinar. I am Lara Whalen, a postdoctoral researcher at the Norwegian Veterinary Institute. As we begin today, I want to remind you all to please turn off your camera and microphone. Should you have questions for our speaker, please type them in the chat box and we will address them at the end of the presentation. It is a pleasure to introduce Helen Gray from Newcastle University. Helen is a postdoctoral research associate in the Asher Behavior Lab, focusing on a combination of behavioral assessment with statistical and agent-based modeling to investigate smothering behavior in laying hens. Broadly, she has interest in the mechanisms of animal behavior and exploring ways that behaviors can be used as welfare indicators. Welcome, Helen. Thank you so much for the introduction. Oh, oh, oh. Share my screen. Hopefully that's sharing okay. It's great. Perfect, thank you. Um, so today I'm going to talk about what open research practices can offer animal welfare science. So a heads up if you were at the uh, AWRM meeting in Newcastle last month, this is very much um, the, the same talk. Um, so just in case anyone wants to save themselves a little bit of time now. Um, I also want to kind of start by caveating that I am by no means uh, an expert in open research, but I'm really passionate about learning about the practices um, and how we can apply these in animal welfare science. I'm going to start with a slightly bleak slide about the reproducibility crisis. Um, this Sorry, just getting rid of a few things on the screen. Um, I've had some interesting conversations with people about whether crisis um, is the correct term to use since I first gave this talk uh, last month. Um, but this is the term that's used the most within the literature. So I'm going to stick with it for this slide. Yeah, nothing's working. <laughs> There we go. Really sorry. Um, so the reproducibility crisis refers to the fact that the majority of scientific um, findings cannot be reproduced. And this is a really kind of scary thought. It's been um, known for a number of years now, but was really brought to light in this nature survey in 2016. Nature asked 1,500 scientists whether they'd ever failed to reproduce an experiment before. What you can see on the y-axis is scientific disciplines uh, split here. So we have chemistry, biology, physics, medicine, earth and environment, um, and other. Um, and on the x-axis, uh, the percentage of people who said yes to the question, have you failed to reproduce an experiment? What we see in the dark red is failure to reproduce uh, someone else's experiment. This sits above 60% for all disciplines. And in the light pink, failure to reproduce one's own experiment, which sits at above 40% across all disciplines. So this paints quite um, a bleak picture of the state of science at the minute. And it's quite multifaceted why we may fail to reproduce an experiment or a study and why we may have false findings within the literature. I've tried to break this down into four broad categories today. So firstly, everyone is under extreme pressure to publish results. We know that novel papers and papers with positive results are more likely to be published than our replication studies or null findings. This leads to practices of p-hacking and selective reporting. P-hacking, if you haven't come across this term before, means that researchers may continue to analyze their data in different ways until they gain a result which supports their hypothesis, normally a significant result. Um, and selective reporting is otherwise known as cherry picking. This means that we pick the results that we want to publish in our paper that help to tell our story. Um, and fail to report any other results which do not support our hypotheses. We also have um, analysis issues, and this is certainly the case in uh, animal welfare. We know that we're working with quite small sample sizes, which can lead to low statistical power. 
Um, but we also have issues across the sciences with poor model choice. Both of these can lead to false findings being published within the literature and can lead scientists down routes of studying results which may not be completely true. We also have logistical issues. So this relates to the fact that we can't get our hands on the code or methods that um, other labs have developed or the data that they've produced from these. And this makes it logistically difficult to attempt to replicate someone else's work. Finally, uh, we have plain old fraud, the deliberate um, falsification or manipulation of results to support one's own hypotheses. So quite a depressing way to start, but I hope that I can show you that um, open research practices can help to combat some of these difficulties that we're facing. But what is open research? Many people conflate open access publishing with open research. So for those of you who um, are not aware, open access publishing means that we publish our papers such that they're not behind a paywall and that they're freely accessible. And this is certainly part of the open research movement, but it's not all that it encompasses. There are lots of different definitions of open research out there um, and synonyms for it. So maybe open science when we're dealing in just the sciences or open scholarship. Um, oh, I'm sorry, I'm having laptop issues. But really what open research boils down to is that there's a transparency throughout the research workflow. This means that we're open in the rationale behind our studies and the hypotheses that we're testing. We're open in the methods that we use and the code and the data that we produce. And we're open in our publication and dissemination of our work. There are lots of different open research practices. And here I just wanted to quickly highlight um, some of the most common ones. So firstly, um, arguably the most robust thing that you could do is to write a registered report. This means that you have your study peer reviewed before you carry it out. In the same way that you would submit a paper for review in a journal, you submit your study plans um, and they're reviewed and you get feedback on them. The idea here is that you, um, the paper that would result from this study is published in the same journal that um, you register your report with. A step back from that is pre-registration. Again, you outline your plans before you carry out your study, but in this case, they're not peer reviewed, but you upload them publicly onto a suitable platform. Both pre-registration and registered reports help to combat the um, cherry picking and p-hacking that I mentioned in the previous slide, um, because they, they allow us to outline our hypotheses that we're testing before we collect any data. We also um, have practices of sharing, which is just as it sounds, making our methods, data and code freely accessible to those who want to use them. We have preprints, which are becoming um, much more common. And we saw a lot of this through um, the COVID-19 pandemic with people uploading manuscripts um, before they've been published in a journal. And we have open access publishing, so making our um, peer reviewed research freely available. And these last three practices really combat those logistical issues that I mentioned before. Um, if our data and our results are more accessible, then more people can use them to further their own research. Um, I want to be clear that this isn't a new idea. So the idea of um, reproducibility and open science has been around since the 1950s, 1960s. Um, and in more recent years, this has been brought to uh, animal science and animal welfare science with um, the work of some people who are in this call today um, uh, and Anna Olson, Berta Nielsen, um, Christian Narot, um, Tobias Krauser, just to name a few. Um, and so this isn't... <laughs> I'm really sorry, I'll just stop for a minute while the dog's barking. <laughs> Okay, hopefully I'm okay. Um, so this isn't a 
new idea, but I think it could be really beneficial to animal welfare. So now that we're all kind of on the same page and we've had a broad introduction to what open research is, I want to bring it back to why it is that we do our jobs. Why are we animal welfare scientists? So I ran an incredibly scientific Twitter poll um, a few months ago asking animal welfare scientists why they do their job. And you can see that from 28 people that answered, we mostly are talking about wanting to improve animal welfare and advance science. Um, this 7.1% are, are clearly just here to work with the cute animals, which is fair. So what I'm hoping I can show you in this talk is that by engaging with open research practices, you can enhance your science um, and we can therefore Im improve animal welfare. One of the things that I struggled with when first trying to get into the um, open science, open research literature was that a lot of it is heavily focused around psychology and medical sciences who have been doing this for much longer. And so what I want to do today is give you some examples from my own research of where I think there are barriers or challenges um, and where there are opportunities. So let's start with the challenges. Challenge one I've called sharing sensitive data. By the very nature of our field of research, we have sensitive data. That might be that we are collecting data on a particularly sensitive topic, for example, um, humane slaughter, or maybe we're collecting data that might not make everybody happy. The example that I want to give here is my work, uh, my PhD work on the welfare of macaques used for neuroscience studies. This was already fairly controversial given the debate around whether or not non-human primates should be used in neuroscience. To make it slightly more controversial, um, I was collecting data on fluid restriction. Fluid restriction um, means that we limit the free access intake of animals to water such that they are motivated to perform um, complex cognitive tasks for small fluid rewards. And this is a commonly used technique in neuroscience, not only for non-human primates, but also for rodents. And it does come with some controversy on uh, the welfare implications for the animals. So I took measures of uh, rhesus macaque weight, behavior and physiology. And I was looking at the differences in two different fluid restriction protocols. Broadly, my results fell into two categories. So on the one hand, I found increased weight loss on more severe fluid restrictions and some increase in what I'm broadly terming here negative behaviours. On the other hand, I found no physiological signs of dehydration and in fact some decreased negative behaviours as a result of more severe fluid restriction. So what I found myself with as a very junior researcher were data that had the ability to upset two different camps of people. Um, to speak quite blunt bluntly, neuroscientists are not going to um, want to know that a protocol that they use may have um, negative animal welfare connotations. Um, and on the other hand, those with a um, preconceived conception that fluid restriction is detrimental to um, macaques may not be interested in knowing that there were, for instance, no signs of dehydration. And this, I think, is a situation that lots of animal welfare scientists can find themselves in. And how do we openly share sensitive data such as these? So I think there are some problems and solutions in sharing sensitive data. I'm really sorry if you can hear my dog running around in the background. It's very distracting. Firstly, um, we have a worry that data or code may be misinterpreted in the wrong hands. This is a worry that um, I hear a lot of people talking about and the solutions that I think might work for us is to really provide as much context and detail as possible if you want to share your data and your code by annotating um, data to um, acknowledge how it was collected 
and what it pertains to means that it, um, there is less chance of it being misinterpreted. You can also consider the access options if you wish to share your data and your code. So not all repositories have to be completely um, open to everyone. There are some with restricted access options such that researchers can apply to have access to your data, but it's still uploaded there in a repository. With the types of data that we collect in animal welfare science, there also comes reputational and personal risk. For those working in universities, if you think that the results that you get or the data or code that you produce may um, cause reputational um, risk to the university, then that's really what the press office is there um, for. And you can speak to them how, about how best to be open about your work. I'd say for um, ECRs, it's really difficult to speak about animal research and animal welfare research if the data that we're collecting are sensitive, and that poses some personal risks to us. There are lots of different organisations um, from which you can seek training on speaking about animal research. Really here, it's about balancing um, openness with personal risk. So moving on to challenge two, but sticking with um, data, I want to talk about commercial data. Lots of us have the pleasure of working with um, industrial partners who may provide us with animal welfare related data. And this was the case when I was at the University of Leeds in my first postdoc under the supervision of Professor Lisa Collins. Here, I was interested in looking at the links between farm management data, respiratory disease and pig production. So we had respiratory data collected um, at slaughter from the Food Standards Agency. This is quite a broad data set of um, things like lesions um, and uh, clinical signs seen at slaughter. And we had production and management data from partner pig producers. And I was interested in modeling the links between all of these to see if um, farm management impacted respiratory data um, respiratory disease, sorry, which in turn would impact pig production. One of our main findings here was that produ pig producers that got their pigs from more than one source farm, um, so on the x-axis here we have the number of farms that producers have bought pigs in from, and on the y-axis the respiratory lesion prevalence, you can see that um, in cases where producers um, buy their pigs in from more than one farm, we have much higher um, prevalence of respiratory disease lesions at slaughter. I then modeled the uh, impact of respiratory disease prevalence on lots of different uh, aspects of pig production. I'm showing here one example of dead weight. So this is how much the pig weighs at slaughter. And as expected, as respiratory disease prevalence increases, the dead weight of the animal decreases. So here we had um, data which were really interesting that we wanted to be able to share with people, but they were commercial and what does that mean for openness? Quite often there are legal contracts and non-disclosure agreements um, in place when we're dealing with um, commercial companies. Um, so we really needed to speak to the legal team to um, ensure compliance with sharing any of these uh, data. Also, we have to bear in mind the personal preferences of the data provider and communication is really important here. I think um, the main message is don't make assumptions about what is or isn't okay when we're talking about sharing data. The way that we got around it with the pig data was that we were able to share aggregate data. Um, so for instance, here we have the, the dead weight distributions of our pigs from different pig producers. So um, the producers were happy for their data to be shared in this way. It wasn't identifiable to them, but it still gives um, readers of the paper some raw data which they can use in their own studies. The key here when we're thinking about sharing is really, um, as is said in the literature a lot, to be as open as possible, but as closed as necessary. You don't have to share everything to be able to um, practice open research. 
So my final challenge that I want to talk about is what I'm terming accidental data collection and sharing. So in animal welfare science, we've used um, a lot of technology and this is only uh, increasing. This is applicable across the different sectors, zoo, lab, farm and companion animals. This is just uh, an example of a couple of different bits of kit that we use in the Asher Behaviour Lab. So on the bottom, we have accelerometers to measure animal movement. And on the top, audio moths. So these record um, vocalizations. I'm using them to record chick vocalizations at the minute. So cameras, um, audio equipment and position sensors may capture accidental data. So we all know that from setting up cameras or recorders, um, we might accidentally video ourselves going in to do something. We may um, capture conversations of uh, care staff. And these are quite obvious accidental data collections that we need to think about. But I also want to share one that might not be as obvious. Um, and this pertains to the fact that we can accidentally collect human data while monitoring animals. So these data were provided to me by Dr. Jack O'Sullivan, who did his PhD in uh, Lucy Asher's lab as well, where he was looking at putting accelerometers on dog collars to measure their movement. Got a simplified graph here of the um, time of day on the y-axis and the dog's activity on the x-axis as monitored by the accelerometer. Uh, and this is taken on day one. So you can see that about two thirds of the way through the day um, as monitored, we get this big peak in activity. We see a very similar pattern um, on day two. So again, around the same time of day, a large peak in activity. Now, from monitoring animal behavior, we can start to collect information about the humans. So um, in this case, the dog was being taken out for a walk at this time. So we start to know when um, the human owners are leaving the house. Um, other things that both Jack and Lucy have, um, have anecdotally told me we can pick up on are things like, um, when are the owners going to sleep? When are they getting up in the morning? And when are they leaving for work? So really we need to be thinking about what else we might be collecting if we want to be open in our data um, and are we collecting things that were non-target um, data. So my solutions for accidental data collection. When we're thinking about whether we want to share footage and audio, we really need some robust post-processing steps. Um, for instance, we might use automatic detection of audio anomalies. Maybe these are um, frequencies uh, which we don't expect to hear in what we're recording, which we can then investigate manually and remove for things like snippets of conversations. And to avoid sharing personal data, we really need to familiarize ourselves with any commercial hardware and software we use in. So this is um, if we buy off the shelf monitoring equipment, um, we need to know who those data belong to um, and what it is that they're collecting, because often behind the scenes, um, bits of kit off the shelf may be collecting more than we bargained for. We can also aggregate and anonymize to a level where personal identification um, is not possible. And it's OK to share in that way. You don't need every single part of your data to be shared. So moving on to the opportunities. The first one I want to talk about is pre-registration. So pre-registration, as I mentioned, outlines a plan for a study. Decisions are made before data collection or data analysis. And the submission is given a DOI, just like a paper would be. Your hypotheses are registered and then tested. We've done this with a recent study looking at whether eggshell, um, characteristics of eggshells could be used as a proxy measure of stress in laying hens. So we pre-registered it and uploaded it onto the open science framework. But we all know that we work with animals and things change. So here is a chicken escaping for the, I don't know, 20th time from the, um, from the study. And we needed to change the way that our animals were housed. So we laid out all of our plans, but they didn't go to plan. So here I want to say that it's okay to change pre-registered plans with a justified reason, but we just need to be transparent. 
So you can see here a screenshot from my pre-registration. Um, and what's circled is study plan amendments. So I needed to change an aspect of my study for a justified reason, and I uploaded an amendment to the pre-registration. So being transparent and open in our methods um, is not only good scientific practice, but it also helps others to know what does and does not work. So housing our hens in this way didn't work, and maybe others could avoid doing that in the future and um, by me being open about how it didn't work. So to provide um, a balanced argument, I want to just quickly touch on whether pre-registration is worth it. There's been a couple of papers now looking at this. So um, a survey on pre-registration affecting research workflow. To sum up, there was better science, but it was more work. It takes more time. And specifically thinking about early career researchers, um, this second paper here showed that the ECR who adopts open science methods will likely complete fewer projects within a fixed period in comparison to peers who work with traditional methods. So there are definitely some trade-offs to pre-registering our work, um, and we really need a cultural shift in what the universities value um, in order for this to be seen as a positive um, thing for us to be doing. There are, I also think, animal welfare benefits of pre-registration. It allows us to iron out any theoretical problems before the study is conducted, which saves animal time. We combat our own researcher biases by deciding, for example, what to do about outlying data before the data are collected. And we carefully plan the statistics. Um, so I think that we have wasted animals if our analyses are not appropriate for the study design. So opportunity two being data simulations. In the previous study I mentioned, egg texture was actually a potential marker of stress. So we wanted to know whether we could use this um, marker to detect stress consequences of piling behavior. And if we could, how many eggs would we need to check on the farms that we had access to to detect true differences? So this is what piling behavior looks like. Um, it's a behaviour that we see in um, free range laying hens in the UK, but it's also seen in other parts of the world. Um, and we get these very dense um, collections of hens where the hens in the middle can die. Um, but we were interested in the sublethal consequences of this behaviour and whether or not it is inherently stressful. So to use the pilot data um, from the study I had, I generated a fake data set and some um, potential sample sizes. I then um, ran the model that I would use to analyze this data a thousand times for each sample size and check the percentage of significant results uh, to plot a power curve. So this took me um, a lot of time and quite a lot of um, R errors. But in the end, I think it was worth it because what you can see from these graphs are on the um, y-axis we have the power for the study with the dotted line showing um, 80 percent which is the um, accepted level um, for adequate power in a study. We have our theoretical number of eggs that I would collect on each farm from 100 to 1000 and then we have a different number of farms um, in each of these panels. So really you can see only when I get to collecting a thousand eggs on 30 farms do I get near to 80% power and even then there's a lot of uncertainty around this. We'd have to really be going um, over 500 eggs at 100 farms, which just is not in any way um, feasible. So that study was called off. I think that there are animal welfare benefits of doing data simulations such as this. So to um, take a uh, lovely figure from Christian and Tobias's paper. Um, I highly recommend um, reading this paper, which goes through different open research practices and how they um, impact on the three R's of replacement, refinement and reduction. Um, but I just wanted to um, put sample size calculations in here too, because I think if we know that our studies might be underpowered, um, and therefore decide not to do them, then we reduce the number of animals used in scientific protocols. 
Um, and my final opportunity to discuss is um, data methods and code sharing. When we think of what um, traditional scientific laboratory looks like, we might picture something like this, one man on his own um, in a darkened room. We know that that's no longer what science looks like. Um, and that's really demonstrated by this online webinar tonight. We are um, networks of researchers across the globe able to share our science with each other. And we can get more out of our research and make access to research more equitable and increase impact if we do share. One way that we've been trying to do this um, is by working with our research software engineers um, into machine learning classification of that piling behavior that I showed you before. So we filmed multiple flocks. We now have way over 60 terabytes of data and we're interested in whether we can detect this piling behavior from the images alone, because as you can imagine, it's very labor intensive to go through the footage. So the work that, um, the, that I quickly want to show you is by uh, Dr. Robin Nandy and Dr. Catherine Garside from Newcastle's Research Software Engineering Department. And the idea behind this is that their code is to be made freely available such that other people interested in this behavior would be able to use their code on their own flocks of hens. So they used a ResNet classification, um, image classification method for two of our flocks of hens. Um, and to just briefly say that this method worked really well in being able to detect piling behavior, both when there was piling behavior and um, in a, it's able to detect no piling behavior when there is no piling behavior. So we have high sensitivity and specificity, but of course this is only tested on two of our flocks. And so this code will be made um, available so that anyone across, across the globe can use it for their own laying hen um, studies. And the animal welfare benefits of sharing are that we're all working along similar themes for similar goals. If we share what we're doing, we have increased visibility of our work and increased collaboration for better science. We can also pool data for larger sample sizes. We have more data for testing new algorithms. Everyone is trying to um, track animals or um, use classification techniques for detecting behavior in images. And if we share our data, um, we can reduce effort duplication on these fronts. So I just want to finish with some wider considerations of open research. Um, Thinking about what the future of academia looks like. This is how I currently see academia. This is very much um, a personal opinion. Um, but if we spend time on research culture, such as open research practices, we have less time for research. We have fewer papers. We get less funding. We decrease our chances of a permanent job and we leave the system. I've seen this happen time and time again to researchers. What I hope that we're moving to and what I'm seeing at my own institution, which is really positive, is that by spending time on research culture, it's seen that we're improving our academic practice. We become a well-rounded researcher and therefore increase our employability. And we have more time then to um, spend on research culture. All of these things, I think, lead to higher quality research. And in our case, higher quality research means improved animal welfare. But we also need to consider equity in open research. Um, and this illustration by Tom Dunn is from a article in American Scientist talking about some of the issues in equity, equity in open research. So open research has the potential to negatively impact researchers in lower income institutions and regions because of financial limitations for open access publishing. Um, it can impact early career researchers, those in unstable employment and those in minority groups because of issues such as um, being in a more precarious situation where you may not want to question senior collaborators. Um, we may have our um, perception and evaluation of our work judged more harshly if we're in these groups. Um, and a quote from this article, which I think is really pertinent, is that open science is built on the same foundation as science itself, and it inherits many systematic barriers that already exist in mainstream science. And so we really need to be um, thinking about these when we think about 
whether we should be moving towards merit for open science practices and what the barriers are for some of our research community. So how do we increase open research practices in animal welfare? Well, we need more awareness and to keep talking about it. So I'm really um, thankful for the opportunity to talk to you this evening. I think we need some more training and knowledge sharing. Some awards for open research practice, which are particularly CV boosting for ECRs. Um, and I'm currently in discuss, uh, discussions about setting something up um, along these lines. Um, and we need to collaborate and data share, which helps to build our networks, which can only be a positive thing. So just some work in progress that I want to finish by um, sharing, which is um, sharing methods. So I'm currently working on a repository with the Animal Welfare Research Network in the UK, whereby which um, animal welfare scientists will be able to share what does and doesn't work in their area. So it's going to be um, a repository that we're currently terming data collection SOPs. Um, this is what it currently looks like, but it's not public yet. So we would have husbandry experiences and guidance, scientific protocols and a template that people could use. If you clicked into the scientific protocols folder, you would get a list of um, species that people might be working on. If you click into species, you would get some different um, methods or protocols that people might be using. And if you click into these, you would see, um, so Simon Turner, who's been working on this with me from SRUC, has uploaded some of his own protocols for an attention bias test and a judgment bias test here. And you'd be able to look at what is being done in other institutions, openly share what does and does not work. So you can see um, a template that we've mocked up here that Simon has used. So pre-weaning socialization of piglets, where the protocol is used, a contact for it, um, how often it's been used. So how much do we trust it? Any publications that have used this approach, um, the aim of the protocol, and then we'd go into um, the methods that are used. So if you were interested um, in, for example, cognitive bias testing, you could log on to this repository and see what's being done at other institutions. So my final thoughts, um, sadly, most scientific results are not reproducible. Um, open research practices better our science and the advancement of animal welfare, and you can be part of the change. When I think about this, it feels quite overwhelming. Um, and so I have to zoom out of the global perspective and think, what can we do locally? So maybe you just have a little look into the open science framework and pre-register your next study. Um, or maybe you have a chat with your lab about how you could be using open research practices um, in your animal welfare science. And a fundamental part of open research to acknowledge the work, contributions and support of others. So I want to thank um, all of these people and especially my PI, Professor Lucy Asher, who is um, incredibly supportive of research culture and open research in general. And thank you. And I'm sorry about all of the uh, interruptions from uh, the dog and technical issues. Thank you. A beautiful presentation, Helen, and not at all something to be sorry for. It's nice to have dogs coming to the webinar, too. It's so distracting when um, he's running around in front of you and you're trying to remember what you're talking about. <laughs> I can understand completely. Uh, I welcome questions, but to get us started, I really thank you for putting together such a thoughtful presentation. And I found myself having questions and then the next slide you answered them. So thank you, Helen. There was one slide that I really liked, this cycle that kind of becomes broken when scientists try to be open research and then the, the I guess, qualifications we have now for job advancement means that they're hindered and they actually leave academia. And I, I agree, I have seen that as well. And you gave some starting solutions, but I wonder in a dream world, how do you envision changing the system? Are meetings and conferences enough or is there something more we can be doing? I think that although a grassroots movement is really useful, we're really going to need to see change from the funders because uh, unfortunately it's the money that talks a lot of the time 
Um, and so the universities and institutions themselves can do so much to promote openness and lots of universities have things like positional statements on open research now, especially well um, from a UK um, uh, perception. Um, but really, until the big players start building open research into um, their grants and start valuing that, I think that's when hopefully we'll start to see um, some big changes. And whether or not that's ethically and morally um, the, the right thing, I'm not sure. But I think that maybe that's what it will take for, for movement in that direction. Money talks. <laughs> Uh, Jenny says, great talk. Thanks, Helen. And the dog is not distracting for me at all. So it's not just me. Uh, Katarina says, thank you, Helen. It was very useful. Good luck on your future directions. Uh, while we are waiting for other questions to come up, do you have any recommendations for where you see data repositories going? Do you think that we, they should be channeled through a university, through the journals themselves? Where, yeah, where do you envision that being, especially with the idea of equitable? Yes, I think one of the main issues we see at the minute, and I think there was a paper out on this last year, I could be wrong, is, is journals following through on saying that they require data to be uploaded. Um, and trying to get hold of the data. So it might be something like data is available on reasonable request. Well, what constitutes a reasonable request for data? Um, and I can't remember the exact um, numbers from, from the paper, but they, uh, the group of researchers tried to access data um, and, and, they, and they couldn't in many cases. So I think, um, so the university that I'm at, we do have our own data repository, but funding for that um, is not, or capacity for that isn't super high. So um, when we think about spreadsheets of data, I think they're really easy to share. Where we fall down in animal welfare science is that the infrastructure hasn't caught up with what we now have as data, which is huge video data sets, images, sound files, which we could all benefit from sharing, but we don't have the infrastructure to do that. Um, myself and my PI have been looking into it, but where would you host it? It costs so much money. Um, and so I think there's a real gap there, um, specifically for animal behavior and welfare, um, where we, we currently don't have the platforms for sharing these larger data sets. Yeah, and I can imagine so many of us do slightly similar studies, and so it would be really cool to bring it all together. But I, I still have some of my data on hard drives because we just don't have enough space elsewhere. Yes, exactly. So Christian says, thank you so much for this wonderful talk and for the great mean game. You mentioned you. that we need more incentives so people are more inclined to implement open science practices in their research. From your experience, do you see these incentives already applied to certain platforms and could maybe name best practice examples, funding, journals, etc.? And then there's another question, but we'll start with that one. Um, so where have I seen examples of incentivizing open research? Yes. Yeah, we are starting to see it now more in the UK, I would say, at the institution level. Um, I'm not sure how much that's the case outside of the UK. So here we have the UK Reproducibility Network, um, which is more kind of about openness and transparency. Um, and universities which are members of the UK RN, um, are encouraged to um, encourage open research practices. And so we're starting to see uh, open research awards at a university level where people submit small case studies um, and they win you know, small prizes for this. It's something to put on their CV. It shows what they're doing um, at their institution. So we run those um, at a university level. Um, I am 
currently in talks with um, yes, yeah, some uh, animal welfare organisations about setting up our own um, animal welfare open research awards. Um, again, there, there are um, equity issues in doing that. And so some researchers may not have had the opportunities that other researchers have had to be able to implement some of these practices. And so I think we really need to also um, bear that in mind um, when we think about starting to reward um, certain practices and we don't want to increase um, the inequity gap. Yeah, and building off of that, what in your opinion would be low cost pathways for creating incentives in the future, if there are any? Low cost pathways. Um, I think there is some responsibility of our institutions. Um, so whether that be that funding for things like open access um, publications. Um, but if we're thinking about incentives, I think really it needs to be a research culture shift, which is incredibly difficult and takes a lot of behavior change and institutional change. Um, and so we can be a small group of researchers really passionate about this, um, but to be blunt, I currently don't have a permanent job I'm a postdoc and so am I just going to have to leave the system because I've put time into being open and I don't have as many papers as some of the people who are at my um level um and so I'm I'm not sure what the answer is um but I think there needs to be a, a culture change um and so we can put incentives out there for researchers but while the metric and currency is number of papers it's going to be hard it's already hard, but yes, it's going to be more hard. Beata says, great talk, Helen. I really want the, it takes more time to pre-register to not be true. Would it not become easier with time or am I dreaming? I keep trying to sell it by saying you're basically just writing the intro and material and methods of your paper before doing the experiment, but perhaps I'm too naive. No, I would agree, Beata. Um, in in my experience, it doesn't add more time um, because yes, the, I write out all the models. We have all of the background information in the pre-registration um, and we just kind of put the pieces of the jigsaw together after we've collected the data. Um, but I think people do perceive it as taking more time if they're having multiple co-authors sign off on um, studies before they're pre-registered. And maybe that's where some of the um, increase in time comes from. I haven't done this with um, an international collaboration, for example, or even really a, a, a huge collaboration outside of my own university. Um, so maybe getting feedback on the study and every author being happy with it is where some of the increased time comes from. But Personally, um, I have not had that experience. Thanks, Helen. Prezad says, it is quite expensive to get a pre-registered report published, especially in an open access form. Are there any journals that do this without a fee? I only know animal behavior and cognition. Yeah, I'm afraid I'm not an expert on this. Um, at our own university, there are publishing agreements um, transformative agreements that we have. Um, again, I'm not sure how applicable that is to other institutions or whether or not other institutions, um, whether these agreements are similar across other institutions. Um, but yes, I'm not, I can't claim to be an expert on um, open access publishing or publishing fees, I'm sorry. Odd says, are you in contact with the European Zoo community through EAZA, Animal Welfare Working Group, for example, or at least the UK zoo community through Biaza, maybe, a, or a particular zoo? Yes, so um, the I very briefly, because I was aware of time, talked about the methods sharing um, repository that we're putting together. 
So through the AWRN, which is a UK animal welfare research network, um, they have a stake, uh, stakeholder board. Um, and so the idea is that um, uh, Biaza and um, some other organizations will be trialing the repository with us. Um, so that things, especially things like um, uh, enrichment use and um, best practice in um, zoo husbandry would be um, uploaded. And recently we just had some feedback that it would be really a, a useful platform to share ethograms. So um, yes, we are in contact with um, Biaza. Very cool. Danielle says, thanks, Helen, for the great talk. I just recently had a conversation on preprints, and one colleague shared their concerns that non-peer-reviewed sources can sometimes be misleading in terms of how they should be interpreted and whether the results are reliable. Unfortunately, preprint servers usually do not allow previous versions of a manuscript to be deleted and therefore increase the risk of miscitation. What are your thoughts on this? Should readers in the era of open science also be more cautious and critical? Yeah, I think it's a, a it's a really um, good point, Genyun. Um I think we saw quite a lot of this in, uh, I, I mentioned briefly COVID with people wanting to get their research out there. Personally, I'm not sure if it's an issue for scientists reading preprints, um, but I do think that there are more issues maybe surrounding um, media attention um, from preprints if things have not been peer reviewed and whether or not um, journalists are aware of the difference between preprint papers um, and peer reviewed publications. So I would hope that with training, researchers would understand the, the uh, differences between um, preprints and um, peer review publications. Um, but again, that does depend on whether you've ever come across a preprint before. And so I do think we need to be um, critical when we read them in the same way that we would when we're maybe reviewing a paper. Um, but for me, more of the danger lies in um, misinterpretation outside of the scientific community and, and how data could be misconstrued in those ways. Great, thank you. That I think are all of the questions. So thank you for going through those and giving such thoughtful answers. And thanks again for a beautiful presentation. Thank you so much. It was a pleasure.